Good morning, everyone. Is, am I on? Loud and clear? It is a pleasure and it is a great honor to follow Rachel and Scott because you both touched on things that I'm actually going to try to get stuck into. So what I really want to do is I want to talk about the common elements of sharing economy businesses because we've actually been able to distill out the DNA of these businesses and this is a basic business principle that will work in any organization. So what we'll do is we'll outline what these principles are and then show how they work in practice. And this can work for any business at any scale, new business or old business can become a transformed sharing economy business. So as you know, I have this weird career that began in technology and then ended up working with a lot of filmmakers because I did work in VR. And then I started hanging out with a very disreputable crowd of bankers a few years ago, which was actually a lot of fun. And I do a lot of work in fintech now. And, but in the last year, the whole VR thing has hotted up again. So I'm kind of between two worlds of doing a lot of work in VR and doing a lot of work in fintech. One of the things that we hold up as the example of the sharing economy is Uber. This is the perception that we're all going to create $68 billion businesses, that we all understand how all of this works, that all of our businesses are going to be able to thrive in a connected economy, but the reality is actually a little bit different. And this is the danger is that there are a lot of businesses everywhere in the world, including in Australia, that are idling in place, presuming that they will be picked up and carried along by the sharing economy and transformed. In fact, all they're doing is they're watching the asteroid as it's coming in. One of my missions in life is to make sure that doesn't happen. And so what I want to do is I want to take you through a case study of arguably the first company to go through this transformation into a sharing economy company. And it was a transformation so profound that they are actually the foundation for the entire sharing economy. It all begins with that dude. That's Jeff Bezos. He's the founder and CEO and the grand leader of Amazon. In 2002, Amazon was already a very successful retailing company in America. And in fact, I moved here in 2003, and the greatest shock I had, the greatest cultural shock I had, was that I no longer had Amazon. Still don't. 2002, he's got a very successful, profitable business. It's a retailing business. But he's looking out beyond what's happening. He's now looking out into an economy that's becoming increasingly connected. And he has to think about how the business that he's built is going to fit into a connected economy. And so he writes a memo. And you can Google for this memo, because this memo is infamous. It is online. This memo has seven points. We're going to take them one by one, because these points are specifically the DNA of the sharing economy. Point one. All teams, so this is all business units, will henceforth expose their data and functionality through service interfaces. This means that if one part of the company wants to get something from another part of the company, how would they do it before? They might make a call, they might have sent an email. It was all very casual, it was all very informal, but the company all worked. Now, no, there's going to be a very specific definition. It's going to be specified, it's going to be strict. This is how you ask for this thing, and if you're offering a service inside the organization, you are going to be able to clearly define how that service gets offered, okay? So, that's first step. Step two. In this great big business that he set up with all of these different business units, he now says, once you've defined these interfaces, that's it. This is the way you talk to one another. You talk to one another through these interfaces. There's no more casual emails. There's no more casual phone calls. We are going to create these interfaces, and we are now going to start to build the business around these interfaces. Point three, no cheating. That's basically what this says. You can't call, because if you call because something was unclear, that means you didn't do the interface right. There's some sort of ambiguity there. You have to be so good in your design that you can't cheat the system. Point four, 
I don't care what technology you're using for this. I, I suppose people could have specified using carrier pigeons. It would have been Baroque, but that would have been fine. But you have a choice of web technologies and all sorts of things. He's like, I'm not religious. If you guys, one team wants to do things one way and one team wants to do it another way, absolutely fine. Just as long as everyone can use them. Point five. And here's the thing. This is the magic. He says, once we have all of these services defined, they're designed to be externalizable. In other words, they aren't just for consumption inside the business. Every one of these services are made to be consumed externally by customers of the business, no exceptions. Which means you have to be careful about the design of your services because you're exposing parts of the business. And it may not always be to a friendly that you're exposing them to. So you have to think that through as well. But it also means that you've taken the entire value of every business unit and turned it not just internally, but turned it externally. And that's the magic moment. Because the key thing that Bezos figured out was that a company that's going to be part of the sharing economy has to learn how to share within itself and then can turn and share outside. It really does say this. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. I believe it actually says, you're already fired. But of course, he didn't want to end on a down note. So point seven, have a nice day. <laughs> so this is 2002, and Amazon basically gets its command call. OK, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this. And everyone in every business unit starts to think about their business processes and how do we redefine these business processes as these services that can be consumed or used by other business units. And it's a, it's a process. No organization has really done this before, so they have a really good think about it. And various business units start to see things. And one of the big things, and Rachel make a big point about this, is that some parts of the organization, when they started to pop up as services, some parts of them weren't utilized very well. And the most noticeable part of the organization that wasn't utilized very well was the enormous computer power Amazon owned to handle the holiday gift traffic. So basically in America from Thanksgiving, which is late in uh, November, all the way to Christmas Day, these servers were going big, 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 100% all the time because they're getting millions of people buying Christmas gifts. Come December 26th, all the way to Thanksgiving again, kind of quiet. But you're paying to power these things. They still have to be on. They're still running Amazon. But once you actually have these servers available as a service that other parts of the organization can buy, and oh yeah, that's right, these services are externalizable, other customers can now use these servers. Well, in 2006, that led to something called Amazon Web Services. Amazon Web Services allows anyone to buy time on Amazon's massive grid of computers. Now, it sort of, you know, launched was sort of a little thing. No one really cared. And the latest profit statement by Amazon, this is now generating $10 billion a year. And because Amazon is a very profit-thin organization in the retailing, 50% of all of Amazon's profits are coming from Amazon Web Services which has to do with finding a service internally and then turning the capacity utilization on it up by figuring out how to share it. And the nice thing about Amazon Web Services is it comes out just about the same time the smartphone does. 2006, we get the smartphone in 2007. Nearly every app on your smartphone is connected to services that are running on Amazon Web services, and ones that you're all familiar with. Dropbox, you probably all use Dropbox to keep your files going. You've downloaded a Kindle book. Where do you think Amazon keeps its Kindle books when you're downloading them? It keeps it on the farm of servers. And so what happens is 
Amazon figures out how to share its internal capacities, and what they do as a result is they create a foundation for all of these other sharing economy businesses to be able to plug into. That's the magic of it. So in order for them to make that transformation, once they made that transformation, they then enabled the rest of the sharing economy. You think Uber has its own services? Uber doesn't have its own services. Uber is running on Amazon Web Services. And that, <laughs> that's made Jeff very, very, very happy. Now, they didn't do this perfectly. Some of the projects, there was a project called Amazon Payments, which I did use. It was used by Kickstarter, which was a payments gateway. It was the most horrible piece of thing you'd ever seen. Just because you can design a service and just because you can make that service usable by customers doesn't actually mean you've made it useful. So that's something to think about. So service design is not trivial. You need to do it well, and you need to listen to your customers while you're doing it. Okay. Now. When I left America, I had a subscription to Netflix. This is what Netflix looked like when I left America in 2003. Netflix in America was a subscription service where you could have three to five DVDs out at any time. They would come in these very cute red mailers. You'd order them online on a web page. They would come in the mailbox. You'd play it. You'd fold over the envelope. You'd put it back, and as it got back to Netflix, they would send you a new DVD. And I know that this sounds kind of Baroque these days, but this was the cat's pajamas back 2000. It was amazing. If you had kids, you had a Netflix account so you could basically keep the Disney library out on loan all the time. Uh, Reed, who's, uh, is it Reed, not Huffman, no, Hastings, who's the CEO of Netflix, always said, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna be able to ship movies over the wire someday when we get broadband, and everyone laughed because in 2000 there was no broadband like that. But in 2007 and 2008, when enough companies started to get broadband, Netflix said, oh my gosh, we can start sending movies into American homes. Now, they had millions of customers. They were going to have to buy millions and millions and millions of computers and connect them to the internet to be able to serve up all of this media all of the time. And in fact, they didn't do any of that. You know why? Because Netflix called Amazon and said, hi, we would like to use an enormous amount of your infrastructure so we can serve up enough video so that 30% of all US internet traffic after 8 p.m. at night is coming from Amazon under Netflix into American homes. So there's a great deal here because Amazon has built an infrastructure that's so powerful that a sharing economy company can plug right into it and send video to every home in America. And of course now these days, every home in Australia. Worked out really well. Amazon's making a lot of money from Netflix. Netflix is making a lot of money out of its customers. But Amazon's a big company. Amazon actually has a lot of different businesses inside of it, and there's another business inside of Amazon called Instant Video. And you know what they do? They do exactly what Netflix does. They ship video into American homes. They produce great programs like Transparent is an Amazon video program. And you know what they run on? Guess what platform they run on? They run on Amazon Web Services. If you need the example of why the sharing economy is different from the economy that comes before it, it's this, because Amazon is doing something so well that they're enabling a competitor to beat them at their own business. Because at one level, Amazon is sharing, and at another level, Amazon is competing, and it's all working. All of those businesses are all making money, but they're all built out of this layer underneath. So this is the core that you need to understand, is that if you do your business right, if you follow the rules as Jeff Bezos laid it down, you will create services that are so appealing, your competitors will chew up to use them. Now, I did an interview for this talk today with Tom Dawkins, who is an old friend of mine, and we're talking about the ideas that I've gone through. And he has a business called Start Some Good, which is basically crowdfunding for social projects. And as I've explained this whole story about Netflix and Amazon, he says, oh, mate, wait, 
we're doing that in our own business right now because we had to handle a lot of the tickets that had to do with customer support and that was a drag on a business. It's something that we weren't really good at, but we had to do it because we have all of these customers. And then Lenny down in, Lenny Mayo, who's an entrepreneur down in Victoria, came up with this great business called Influx. It's a service. It's a sharing economy business. It's designed to provide one service really well. And what Tom said is, we redesigned our business to accommodate this new service. And as we're moving forward, we're listening to our customers so that we can stay ahead of their needs, offer the services that they want, but also find the external services that we can blend with our own business to provide a better customer experience. This is what a modern sharing economy business looks like. It's built out of pieces that it does really well and built out of pieces that it's getting from other companies who have focused on doing those bits so well that they're going to do it better than you can. So you need to think now, if you're running an established business, and by the way, the ATO is an established business, so think about that too, you need to think about what it's going to take to open yourselves up inside, to be able to take the business as you understand it and turn it into services that talk and share, not just within the boundaries of the business, but also out into the entire world. Because the better you are at both of those, the better you're at sharing internally and sharing in externally, the better you will integrate into the business fabric of a connected economy. And so this is the question you need to ask yourself. This is the way you need to think in order to be able to adjust to an economy where connectivity is now becoming the way we knit business models together. Thank you very much.